like, yo, I'm tired of arguing. I'm not getting on the ground. So I start to leave. I just walk off. So now they following me. Unbeknownst to me, it's a cop behind me, but I'm arguing with the one on the side of me. So we walk off. And then I start trying to get away. I start to a light jog, probably like a brisk walk. Now I'm drunk. And some in my head say, yo, fuck this. It's over with. I can't get away. So I just reached, reached for the gun, took it out the bandana while I'm running. And then I just backed out. Started shooting right there. But I only get one shot off. So the cop in back of me, he shoot me five times. The cop on the side of me shoots me two times. And then I woke up like two months later. Welcome back to Locked In. I know you all love the prison gang banger stories, and this episode is sure to not disappoint. I have Franz Beyer here with me today to not only share entertaining and insightful stories from his time in prison, but to leave us inspired as to how he was able to overcome his failures, leave behind his past, and create a new life for himself. Thank you to all the viewers and listeners that tune in week after week, month after month, and even just have been supporting us for the last year to help grow Locked into a top 200 podcast in the world. Remember to leave us a review on Apple or Spotify or hit that follow button on YouTube so we could keep on producing high quality content. And remember to shoot me a follow on my Instagram, Ian underscore Bick, or on my Snapchat, Ian Bick. Now sit back, relax, and get ready to lock in with Franz Beyer. You came to us from Stanford today, so that's that's local to uh, to here. Yeah, so I, I'll be back and forth between Stanford and New York. So I'm still in New York, but I be I spent a little bit of time in Stanford. D- did you grow up in Stanford? Nah, I only been coming up to Stanford for like maybe like eight months. Okay, where did you grow up? Long Island. Long Island. Where yeah. in Long Island? Hempstead, Freeport, Hempstead area. I almost lived in Hempstead. I ended up living in like Massapequa when I worked for Whole Foods. Yeah, you uh, went out. That's that's like the boonies type <laughs> shit. <laughs> yeah, right? they're like that. The, 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 um, you ever have shrimpies, burritos? Nah. Oh, dude, amazing. It's like ch- Chipotle, but for seafood out there, really good. Yeah, I never heard of that And then shit. I lived uh, kind of like in the hood in, um, in um, Long Island. It was like... Uh, it was like kind of closer to JFK. Um, the airport, right? So that's like borderline Queens. Yeah, you got Valley Stream. You got Elmont Valley North Valley Stream. North I think Valley I live. Stream. That's, that's like the. That's, uh, <laughs> that wasn't a good area yeah, where I was living. Uh, that's I. Right, it was okay. Yeah, I heard Hempstead's decent though, right? I mean, if you want to get towards like like the gritty parts, you want to call it a hood or whatever, mm-hmm. you got. You got Hempstead, that's in Nassau County. You gonna have Hempstead, you gonna have Freeport, you gonna have uh, Roosevelt, towns like that. But now, nah, if you heard it was nice, you need to go check it out yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, what was your childhood like? Childhood, growing up. Uh, well, my pops was there for a little bit. I don't know where the fuck he went. Probably when I was like five, whatever. I can remember. I know he got locked up. So when he got locked up. I probably ain't never see him again until I like 10th or 11th grade in high school. So really my mom's did that shit by herself. I got two brothers and a sister too, so. It was just your mom's or did you have a stepdad? Nah, we don't do stepdads, man. We don't do that. <laughs> mom's might have had a boyfriend or whatever, but it's like, yo, you play your position. You know what I'm saying? You not nothing to us. We don't listen to you. We respect you because of mom's, but we don't give a fuck about you. Was it hard growing up without a father or having a father in prison? Well, it wasn't even, it's like, you don't got it, so you don't miss it. Because I was so young, I ain't really even give a fuck. Mm-hmm. So it's like, growing up without our moms did everything. So we ain't, we ain't really miss them. And the only reason why he came back into my life is because I had kids. So I had kids when I was in high school. So I had twins when I was in high school. And that's the only reason why he came back into my life, because he heard that I had kids and he wanted to meet his grandkids. And that didn't go over so well. So, Did your mom ever try to explain to you, like, why he was in prison and where your father was? Mm, well, we knew. It was kind of like some deep, dark shit that, that that nigga did in the streets and to family members that nobody never really talked about. But uh, we knew what he did and we knew why he was in prison. So when he came out, nobody wanted anything to do with him no more did people tease you in in school about having a dad in prison nah 
see, in the area that we grew up in, that's kind of common. Really? So it's not a lot of people had dads. So, and the people that did have dads, I think those was the people to be teased most. Like, <laughs> yo, you got two parents in your house, man. What you doing in the hood? What you doing in the streets? Why you doing this? You got a mom and dad. So it was kind of like the opposite. So you didn't feel like an outcast or anything like that? <laughs> nah, hell no. Were you close to your siblings? Um, My brothers, yeah, because we're like, we're all like, I'm 37. I got an older brother that's probably like 39. And my younger brother probably like 36. Then I got a sister. She was the oldest. So we was all brought up close. So in in our family, I say I was more closer to my sister. And my two brothers, they were more closer to each other. They had their own set of friends that they hung out with and shit like that. And I was always the outcast with them. How do you think your friends would have described you in high school? Uh, in high school? Yeah. Probably like a maniac. <laughs> Definitely probably a maniac. Crazy. He ain't give a fuck. And uh, like the girls would probably describe me as nasty. <laughs> nasty? Why do you think nasty? I think I was the first person in high school to like make the eating pussy phase <laughs> popping. Yeah, so, no like, one talked about it in high school. Yo, man, I was in high school like 2001, 2, 3, 4. Nobody was eating pussy. Nobody was eating ass. And I guess I was a fast starter. So I was doing it all. And then years down the line, when everybody else got on the gravy train, they was like, yo, man, you was the first person that ate pussy in high school. We were scared to even talk about it. But I'm like, all right, it's whatever. Yeah, kids were scared, even when I was growing up. Man, that was the best thing ever. If you ain't do it, then I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you was trying to do, man. So the girls called you nasty for the that. The girls one. loved it, man. Yeah. My mans, all the niggas in the hood, they called me nasty. The girls love it. And then, you know, when you get an argument with a girl, they throw it in your face. That's why you ate my pussy. All right, so... <laughs> It was. I like it. It was good. So, what you want to talk about? Were you uh, good in school, like grades wise? Uh, I was. See, I didn't graduate high school. I ended up getting a GED. Okay. So, the only reason why I didn't graduate high school because I suck at math. <laughs> like I couldn't pass math for shit, man. And I had a teacher. For me to pass math, I needed a sixty-five. He refused to give it to me, so I kept getting a 64, 64, 64. And I just said, "Fuck this! I'm dropping out, man. I ain't with this." So everything else, yo, I was good in, like, English. I love science, social studies, even to this day, like, current events, world politics and shit. That's my shit, so. Did you have, like, aspirations, what you wanted to be when you grow up? I was heavy into the street. So my aspirations was the street. That was it. And the street always, like, trickled over into school. So high school was crazy for me. So it went from being bullied and probably like junior high because I never was in a street type of dude. So junior high was a lot of bullying. And then when I got to like, I said like ninth grade, yo, it snapped to say, yo, fuck it. It's going to be no more bullying. So I just started picking up weapons and just bringing weapons to school. So at the same time, while I'm trying to learn, it wasn't ops back in the days. It was like, yo, it's dudes outside waiting for you. These are enemies. They want to jump you. They want to do this. And it just went from there. And this is all as a high school kid. You're just involved in all of this. My first time getting locked up, I was in um, I was in ninth grade. And what did you get locked up for? I got locked up because some other kids was going to my brother's school. He was still in junior high, my younger brother. And I went up there. I used to put kitchen knives in my belt, in my belt loop. So I had a whole belt loop of kitchen knives like I was fucking Batman or some shit. So I went to my brother's school and I ended up getting stopped by the police. And when they searched me, I had all those fucking knives on my belt loop, and they arrested me right there. I was 14. I went to Sparford in uh, in the Bronx. Why do you have all those knives? What was the need for that? Because I was about to go stab. I, I felt like me growing up, if I pull a knife out and I go to stab, you said, like, I use it, I got another one on my belt loop. So I can always just keep pulling shit out, like, boom, boom, boom. How do you take it off the belt loop? It wasn't on the belt loop. It was kind of, like, just tucked in between okay. the belt loop and the pants. So the handle would be more thicker, so it would hold in place. Are they in, like, a case or something? Nah, they kitchen knives, man. <laughs> so what if it, like, poked you while if you go to sit down or anything I, like I that? I ain't going to say I was a professional <laughs> knife handler as a 14-year-old, but I didn't get poked, so I was all good. Did you ever stab someone at that age? At that, nah, because I had got locked up, and then I did a couple months in Sparford, so they let me out. They let me out of Sparford, and then... On probation, then I went right back. So I went back to Sparford for selling weed. Now, weed was like the fucking biggest thing back in like 
2000 and it was still highly illegal. So I wanted to sell weed as a 14 year old and I ended up selling to an undercover cop. How'd that go down? So somebody called me to a house to um, sell some weed. It was like a little dime bag or some shit. I get to the house. As soon as I knock on the door, the police open the door. And I got arrested right there on the spot. So I go back to Spofford. And, yeah, that was the bullshit. Are you running, like, are you in a gang? Is, is that what this is? Or is it just all individual kids running around? No, see, now nah, at that time, I was, a, I was a youngin'. So I was 14. It wasn't no gang. It was just some individual shit. Gang banging ain't really start until, like, 17, 17, 18. Which is still young. Yeah. Okay, so f- you get arrested at, f- at ninth grade, and then you get jammed up again in 10th grade? In ninth grade. Uh, it's still in ninth grade. <laughs> Same shit. What did they give you for that second arrest? So I got probation again. So this time probation, they was like, yo, you stay out of trouble for six months to a year. Everything is is wiped clean. So I don't want to say I learned my lesson because I was still doing bullshit. I just never got caught. So I was able to stay out of trouble for that amount of time. And then it all got wiped clean. What did your mom say to you when you got arrested for the knives? <sighs> Man, my mom was crazy. So she's kind of like, she's kind of like, yo, everything is on the books. So she was the reason why I got arrested. So when I get out of Spafford, um, they don't they come to me for the uh, probation violation. So I had long hair back in the days. I had braids. I had earrings in both ears. So. Two police come to the crib and they're like, yo, we got a warrant for your son. Boom, boom, boom. So my mom lets him in the house. Now, when I had long hair, I didn't have my my braids done. So I had a scarf on my head. So I'm laying in the bed. Yo, the police actually walk past me like, yo, that's not him. That's a female. So my mom came up the stairs. She was like, no, that's not a female. That's him right there. So that's when I hop up. Now, I'm all of 15. I hop up and now we start tussling with the police or whatever. So... I'm getting the best of this one cop. He's a little short white cop. I'm getting the best of him. We tussling, blah, blah, blah. Then this big black cop come in the room. He come running up the steps. He mace me. They cuff me up. They take me to uh, Spofford. <laughs> so what did my mom say? She led him to me. Oh. So it's like. But she didn't. She Did she mean to do that on purpose? She didn't mean to do yeah. it. But I'm like, ma, listen, there's two cops. They just told you they got a warrant for me. If you hear them say, yo, that's not him. That's a female right there. Yo, let him go. She just said, she was like, no, that's not a female. That's him right there. And I just pounced up. I said, nah, fuck this. I can't go to jail. Were your siblings getting into any trouble like you? Nah, I was the, like, the the fuck that went out the bunch. Why do you think that was? <sighs> yo, I, I, I can't even say why. Every so often, my mom would be like, yo, you just like your dad. Like, my dad, he was a, a Haitian immigrant <laughs> from Haiti. Um, He was heavy into the streets. He was in one of those motorcycle gangs. I don't know which one, but from all recounts, all accounts that I can recall, his name was just ringing in the street like, yo, this is your dad. He out here robbing stores. He in motorcycle gang. He doing this. Uh, one time he came to the crib. My mom asked him for some money. He just popped the trunk and just went in the trunk and got some money. And then another time he come pick us up. It's just $100 bills and $20 bills on the floor of his car. I don't know if this nigga was a bank robber, a bodega store robber. I don't know what he was. But he just always had. He was just that dude. Were you ever curious, and maybe even to this day, curious about why you got that from him? Like, somehow? I say every we all got a part of our dad. My sister, she got a different dad. But, yeah, I don't know, man. I was never curious. I just go with the flow. I feel like this is me. I'm not him. I'm me. Yeah. All right, so you get jammed up those two times. What happens next? You, you get cleared from probation. Yeah, cleared from probation. I stay out of trouble. Um, I don't get jammed up again until um 18. Now, mind you, all these is misdemeanors and shit. So 18, I get jammed up. So I have my kids and then my baby mother, her father, I'm at her crib and I'm like, yo, I, w- I need to go home. So they're like, yo, go ahead, take my car. So I take his car and I'm driving down the street, driving down the highway on the street and the police pull up to me, the detectives on the side. So automatically, I'm already in, like, fight or flight mode. So I roll the window down, tell the cops, like, yo, go ahead, because it's the green light. They're like, nah, you go ahead. So I just speed off. Arr! Speed off. Now they chasing me in the back. So I, I, I ain't going on a high-speed chase. I took them on a low-speed chase, and then I turned into the Chinese restaurant parking lot. 
tried to hop out, but they boxed me in and they get me out the car. They start running tags and shit. I ain't know it had two different license plates on the shit from the front and the back. It's two different license plates. So I know it's a title in the car. So I'm like, yo, I was like, here go the title. They run the title, the title stolen. Fucking, it got registration from another car uh, on a on a windshield. So they take me in for that shit. Um, I spent a night in jail. Then they let me go. I ended up going down for um, stolen, being in possession of stolen plates, um, stolen property for the stolen car, and shit like that. Uh, I had to pay a bunch of fines for that shit. It was no jail time. It was just a bunch of fines. So did the did she did her father set you up? Nah, he ain't set me up. I didn't know he was a like a major car thief. <laughs> So, <laughs> would, that, would, would that be something she would tell you? No. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't find out to I got caught in one of his cars. So, like, he was the type of dude, like, every time he come out of jail, he got mad cars in his, in, like, in his, his parking lot. He got Jeeps. He got Camaros and shit like that. And I used to ask myself, like, where the fuck is all these cars coming from? But I never paid attention to it because he was the dude. And until he let me hold that car, boy, and I got caught in one of his stolen cars. So, and he didn't take the heat for you? Nope. Wow. Cause he ended up he ended up going to jail anyway. Probably like uh, say a week or a couple months after that. Okay. Or like a month after that. So that happens, and you haven't graduated high school either. So nah. you, would you drop out? I didn't drop out then because I just had my twins at that year. So after the regular twelfth grade, I go to night school. So now I'm in night school for um, math to pass math, and I can't pass math. And every day after night school, I'm fighting a dude out in the front of the school. For what? So, because it now is gang beef. So now it's local gangs, and now it's my gang. And what's your gang? So, and from the town where I'm from, it's called Freeport. We had a gang called H-Block. Now, I didn't turn blood until probably like a little bit after we created H-Block. So H-Block was beefing with a local gang called T.O.P., they call themselves like thugged out players, some bullshit like that. But they was the biggest gang out there. And they was trying to recruit everybody. It was like, yo, get down and lay down, like fucking state property type shit. And we wasn't laying down. So every day after school, we beefing with them. I'm getting jumped every day after school. So now it came to a point where I graduated from bringing knives to school. Now I'm bringing guns to school in a backpack with the math books. So that's when we stopped. It stopped all the jumping process. It stopped everything right there. So after that first year of uh, night school, that's when I dropped out. I said, fuck it. And having kids and let alone twins, didn't it, you know, inspire you to say, hey, I got to get out this life? I didn't, I didn't think about that until I got out of jail, until I got out of prison doing that eight years. Which it was too late by then because you got the eight years. It was too late. I came home. My kids was grown as shit. And it's like, now I want to be a dad. So I'm the type of dude that... I'm all, I'm always going to give my all to whatever I do. So if I'm gangbanging, that's what I'm doing. It's like, fuck everything else. So I am I was kind of like a parent on the side. Gangbanging came first. And what was your role in the gang? Were you just like a soldier or were you, were you everybody, high up? Everybody a soldier when you first start. Okay. So you got to work your way up. And, and this is the Bloods. So now after H Block, now it's Bloods. So I turned Blood when I was about, I'm going to say like 17 or maybe in the beginning of 18. So now it's time to show and prove. You got to show and prove to all your big homies in the street what you could do, what you're not scared to do, and what you're capable of. So in, in my neck of the woods, the only beef was Latin King, Major MS-13, and folks. It wasn't really Crips around there. It was, but we was kind of cool with the Crips. I never really felt like Bloods in New York should beef with Crips. So it's Lad King, MS-13, and maybe Folk. Who teaches you all of this? Like as a new gang member, are there like higher ups that sit the person down and give the history of the gang? Yeah, so now you got the big homies. So you got the big homies in the street. So now from what I realized later going to jail and shit, if your big homie ain't never been to jail and met the real big homies or everybody who started blood, then you probably get half of the story or it's like, you don't really believe a lot of what they say. Because for me, it's different It's different bloods. You got street bloods and you got jail bloods. Mm -hmm. You got prison bloods. So, yeah, it's really the big homies who's teaching you everything. And they let you just switch from your own gang to becoming a blood. See, they approached me. So 
when I was in H Block, we started we started getting meeting a lot of people that had gun connects. So I was like, yo, we had a lot of guns on our block. And our block was like one way on and one way off. So when we started getting a lot of guns, it started ringing a lot of bells in the neighborhood. So the big homies came to me. They already knew me. Like I said, my sister was older, so they went to school with my sister. So they approached me and my team like, yo, we want all y'all to be blood. Y'all could keep y'all name. We just want you to be under the umbrella of bloods. And yeah, my dumb ass said, yeah. So I'm like, yeah, yo, like, this is what it is. Everybody was like, yo, we don't know, we don't know. I say, yo, fuck everybody. So I was the only one that did it. I turned blood out of everybody in H Block. Were you doing it to be cool or to fit in? What, what was, I was the— all, I was already that. Okay, so what, what, why do you need to become a blood then? In my head, I'm going to say the violence and the beef intrigued me. So in that day and age, the more beef you had— and the more violence that you committed and you was able to commit, the more status you had in the street. Even though you ain't really had no status in being a gang member, but you had status with the bitches, you had status with the with the niggas, everybody was scared of you, so I kind of thrived off of that. What do you think is the biggest misconception about street gangs? That they care about you. That's what you think? That, that, that I know that. Hmm. So I was a stri- I'm a street blood, I was a prison blood, and I came out. So it's like... Yeah, they don't really give a fuck, man. They don't care. And when did you realize that for the first time? I realized that while in prison. But I'm so into to being a Damu. A Damu? <laughs> yeah, Damu. That's another name for blood, Swahili. Okay. okay. So bloods really, they really go off a lot of Swahili. So I was so into being a Damu that I wanted to further it. I wanted to further the cause no matter what. But I put in my head like, yo, when I finally get out of prison, yeah, I'm still going to be blood, but it's going to be a different type of blood. And that's what I did. How do the bloods operate? Is there like a, do you guys like have meetings? Is it like kind of like the mafia at all or, or these biker gangs? In, in in where, the street? Yeah, in the street. So, yeah, it's a 9-11. So they call it a 9-11. Um, that's when you have your meetings. So everybody is mandatory. So if one of the big homies like, yo, we got a meeting, we got to do this, we got a 9-11, pick a destination, everybody got to come. Now, it's going to go from paying dues, which we say is going towards the kitty. The kitty is the bank. So we got to put money towards the kitty, whether it's for weapons, whether it's for guns, whether it's for bail, or whether it's for whatever we need. Then we got to discuss if you got any openings. Uh, we could discuss that. We could fill these roles. We could figure out what's going on in the hood, who we beefing with, what's the ops. It's just everything got to come together. Everybody got to be on the same page and everybody got to be safe and aware. So let's fast forward now to the, you get the eight year and nine year prison sentence. How yeah. does that go down? So I caught my, I caught that bid because, all right, so I was in Job Corps. Now, right before I went to Job Corps, I was on a run for a shooting with some Crips. So we ended up going to these bitches' crib and I don't know how these script niggas, they came over there, but they came and we about two cars deep. So now we hide our guns in the sunroof of the car. It's a little space in the sunroof. So we got like a couple 25s and some real small guns. I think it's a 25 and a 32 in the sunroof. So now the Crips come. So we got in the fist fight with them. We washing them. We beating their ass. So one of my mans, he just go to the car for no reason get the gun out the sunroof, and just start blasting the Crips. Police come. The Crips ain't tell. The bitch is told. So they gave us all our names. So we all live on the same block. So now the police, they come with the SWAT teams. They starting on the block. I live in the middle of the block. So they start on each end of the block. Boom. They got uh, they got my boy that lived down here. They got my boy that lived down here. They got my other boy right here. Now I get the phone call. They say, yo, SWAT is rounding up everybody. So I go and look out my window. They already around my house. So I don't know what to do. So my first thing to do, I go in the basement. We got a big ass dryer in the basement and it's filled up with like comforters and sheets and shit. I guess my mom was doing laundry that day. So I pull all those shits out and I go in the dryer and I pull them all back in. So now I'm hiding in the dryer. So they knock on the door. 
My mom let him, you know, my mom letting in police with warrants. <laughs> she let them in, but she had some sense this time. She told them, like, yo, uh, all of y'all not coming in. I'll let two of y'all in, and we got a no-shoe policy in my house. My mom made them take their fucking shoes off while they came and looked for me. So they searched the whole house. They didn't find me, and so they just left. The same day I went on a run, I went to Philadelphia. Stayed in Philadelphia for a year until the case was up. So... One of one of my boys who ended up getting arrested, he took the charge for the case. I was able to come back. I go to Job Corps. Now Job Corps offers you a uh, like um weekend passes type shit where you could go back home. So this was a summer vacation. This was in July. So I go back home. My man having a barbecue. So he's like, "Yo, forty, come to the barbecue." That's my name. They call me forty. So I'm like, "All right, cool." I got my gun wrapped up in a in a bandana in a back pocket. Got my bottle of liquor. Go to the barbecue. Now the barbecue's janking. As soon as I get to the barbecue, somebody's being robbed in front of the barbecue at gunpoint. So the dude across the street calls the cops and say, yo, somebody's getting robbed in front of my house. Hurry. At this time, I'm like, yo, fuck this um, barbecue. I turn to leave. I go down the block. So the police is coming down the block the way that I'm going, and they automatically stop me. So they're like, freeze. They didn't stop me regularly. They got out the car with their guns already. Freeze. Get on the ground. And I'm like, nope, this ain't happening. So I'm already drunk. I got my bottle of liquor, some fucking Jack Daniels. I don't know if you drink it. Don't ever drink that. <laughs> so it's like this much left. So I'm like, nah, I'm not getting on the ground. So we arguing. So after we get arguing for like five minutes, I'm like, yo, I'm tired of arguing. I'm not getting on the ground. So I start to leave. I just walk off. So now they following me. Unbeknownst to me, it's a cop behind me, but I'm arguing with the one on the side of me. So we walk off and then I start trying to get away. I start to a light jog, probably like a brisk walk. Now I'm drunk and some in my head say, yo, fuck this. It's over with. I can't get away. So I just reached, reached for the gun, took it out the bandana while I'm running and then I just backed out, started shooting right there. But I only get one shot off. So the cop in back of me, he shoot me five times. The cop on the side of me shoots me two times. And then I woke up like two months later. Two months later? Yeah, I was in a coma. Holy cow. So they shot me seven times. So you were in a full-out police shootout. That's what I got all those years for. So now I'm in a coma. They take me to the hospital. They like... From what they told me, I'm breathing on my own on my way to the hospital. When I get to the hospital, my lungs collapse. So as a result of my lungs collapse, I catch pneumonia. So now they got to put the trach in me. So one of the bullets hit my kidney on the left-hand side. The bullet in my leg, it went in and out. The bullet in my right leg, it shattered the femur bone. So I got the rod in my leg. So they arraigned me in a coma. I'm not even awake. They so can arraign you in a coma? They can arraign you in a coma because now I'm brought up on charges already. So as soon as I come out of surgery, they arraign me in a coma. So my lawyer is there, family members is there and all that. I'm shackled and I'm handcuffed to the bed. The whole two months? The whole two, in a coma. Wow. So now I got two cops, they guarding my door. So they arraign me in a coma. I end up waking up and shit. Um, Did you remember everything that happened when you woke up? It's crazy because everybody asked me that, but it was like a big ass dream. So I had a long, consistent, violent dream. Yeah. What did it feel like waking up? Does it, does it feel like you missed two months or does it feel like you just went to bed for one night? All right. So I wake up, I got the tube in my throat so I, and I got a feeding tube in my nose. So I know I remember getting shot that wasn't there. So when I wake up, I pull the tube out of my nose, out of my nose, and I pull the trachea out of my throat. So then that's when they rush me. They strap me down now. Now I'm strapped to the bed. So they gotta reinsert the trachea, reinsert the the feeding tube. And now I'm just strapped there. Now I'm just laid down again. Now they, did they know that you were gonna wake up or it was they didn't know? They put me in a um in an induced coma. Okay. Because of all uh all the injuries that I had. So I had to have the shit bag too, the clash me bag. Ooh. I had all that shit, man. They had to put the rod in my leg. They had to put the screws in my leg, all that shit. 
So when I finally woke up, I just started wow, and I just started pulling everything out, and then they strapped me down to the bed. So I wake up with a million dollar bail. So I can't make that. So they sent me to the prison ward at the hospital. And I'm sitting there. I got cops by my side constantly. Probably could get one visit a week. Now we go for a bail reduction. Bail reduction, they denied it. I ended up getting another bail reduction to a half a million. When they dropped it to a half a million, I made that bail. Some of my people's put up some property for it. So all that meant was they took me out the prison ward. They put me in a regular hospital, got rid of the police, took the shackles and the handcuffs off, and now I got to heal up. So after I heal up, matter of fact, they sent me to a, um, a nursing home to learn how to walk again. A rehab type Yeah, rehab, because now I can't walk. I can barely sit up because my back is fucked up. I got five bullets in my back. So I had to learn how to walk again. I did a rehab for a year. Soon as I get out of rehab, I start trial because they offered me 15 to life. So when they offered me 15 to life, my lawyer was like, yo, don't even worry about that. We're going straight to trial. We don't want to hear no offers. We don't want to hear none of that. So as soon as I learned how to walk again on like um, crutches and a cane, I go to trial. Trial probably lasted like fucking a month or two or some shit like that. And I blow trial. Wait, you went to trial, you lost trial, and you got less time than what they offered you to this begin with? This is the thing. So when we had the shootout, the police flipped the story. They said they shot me in my chest. They said they shot me in my stomach and they shot me in my chest. They tried to justify it. That's why I had the shit bag. That's why my whole stomach was open. But then we brought in the experts. So the experts, they testified, yo, he couldn't have been shot in the front of him. We brought the doctors that did the surgeries. He couldn't have been shot in the front. So you can't shoot a guy in the back. Police can't shoot you in your back. So now they trying to say, like, yo, he's shooting at us. Boom, boom. All right, listen, you can't prove this. And then they got a gun. So they got a gun that's in three pieces. So the police said they shot the gun out of my hand. Now, this shit is 1 o'clock in the morning. So are y'all fucking sharpshooters? Are y'all Navy SEALs? <laughs> so they said, one cop said, yo, I aimed at the gun. I shot the gun out of his hand. So I was like, all right, yeah, that's bullshit. So we got around a lot of that. So I ended up getting arraigned three different times. So the first time I got arraigned, they took it to the grand jury. Grand jury came back, nothing. So they rearranged me. They just flipped the charges, flipped the statutes. Second time I got arraigned, grand jury came back, nothing. Flipped the charges, flipped the statutes. The third time I got arraigned, that's when they indicted me. So I went to trial on that. So for that night, I got a robbery charge. I got a gun charge. I got menacing the police. I got um, two attempts on the police. And I believe that was that. That was it. And what was a so that wasn't the most serious charge. Like it could have been worse, but you guys were fighting it before trial. Yeah, but everything that they was arraigning me on, it was essentially the same shit, just different statues and bullshit like that. So when I finally got indicted, that's when they offered me the fifteen to life. Now, I don't know if you know. But anytime they put a fucking life on the end of something, you're not copping out to that. Because off of 15 of life, I'm a gangbanger. Off of 15 of life, I go to prison unless I fucking go find Islam or something. Like, I'm going to end up doing 20, 25 off of that. So, mind you, before this, I never had a felony. So now I'm a first-time offender. So, I go to trial. I beat the robbery because I, I ain't fucking robbed nobody. We went through... Mad witnesses. They gave me two gun charges. I beat one gun charge. And I beat one of the um, attempts on the police. So I blew trial to attempted assault on the police. No, I blew trial to possession in the third of a firearm and menacing the police. And they found you not guilty on the rest. On everything else. They found me not guilty okay, on everything so else. Okay, so the attempted murder or anything? Oh, yep. Okay. So it was menacing police. Okay. So 
that was a maximum of seven years. The CP3, criminal possession, was a max of seven years, and they ran all of that together. So it worked out better, actually, that you went to trial. Yep. So what also worked out better was, now, I was on bail this whole time I was on trial. So now for my sentencing, when I blow trial, the judge tells me, he's like, yo, listen, you've been real prompt with coming to trial. You haven't missed a day. I blew trial on a Friday. So we argued like, yo, he want to say bye to his kids. He want to do this. He want to do that. He's been coming to trial. He never missed a day. He got a lot of support in the community. The judge said, all right, turn yourself in on Monday for sentencing. I said, okay, cool. We can do that. So I went and had a ball the whole weekend. I was fucking <laughs> prostitutes. I was paying for all types of pussy. I got drunk. I caught chlamydia. It was mad shit going on. <laughs> so <laughs> oh, so man. Monday came in. I said, all right, I did it all, man. Like, it's time to go to jail. You showed up to jail with your chlamydia, chlamydia medicine? Yo, man. <laughs> it, I know I didn't find out I had chlamydia until they admitted me in jail. Okay. And they took my blood. They was like, yo, like, you got chlamydia. You got to take these pills. I'm like, yeah, I know exactly. So you got the free antibiotics? Yup. You, you knew who gave it to you? It was probably the prostitute I was fucking that same <laughs> night, a little stripper bitch. So, um, so the judge was like, yo, he could have gave me 15 because the max for the gun was 15. So he was like, yo, you're a first-time offender, and you've been coming to trial. We didn't have to come get you. We didn't have to hunt you down. He said, I'm going to give you half of 15. And I'm like, at that time, I'm like, all right, cool. Run it. <laughs> Run that shit, man. Run it. So he gave me seven. When you're in the hospital, do you feel like you were fairly treated by the hospital employees, even though that you were locked down? See, around my neighborhood, a lot of the hospital employees was from the neighborhood or the surrounding neighborhoods. So a lot of the nurses and the doctors, they would argue with the police because of the treatment that the police was giving me. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting in the bed and I need my shit bag changed because I'm shitting all over myself. And the, the police don't want to let the nurses in the room to change the shit bag. Nurses was throwing a fit on my behalf. So I got to give it up to the nurses in uh, Nassau University Medical Center in Long Island. I wonder how some of the, the nurses and doctors treat the people where they're not used to that. Well, you know, like, it, it, or like I know Danbury, Connecticut, where I, where I live, the town over, there's the federal prison there. So they're constantly yeah. getting people and they're used to that. But if you're in an area where you're not used to seeing that, yeah. I don't know. And if you're a first time nurse, maybe uh, you're young, you it don't might, know how to handle it. But this, this hospital is connected to the county jail hmm. by a long hallway. So they used to that type of shit. They used to, to the COs bringing inmates in, everybody coming out. The jail is connected to the hospital. But the doctors and the nurses, they wasn't having that. And then, like I told you, we had to bring the doctors that did the surgery in for witnesses because the police said that I was facing them and shooting them like this and that they shot me in the front. So now the doctors is arguing with the police. They're like, yo, I'm about to get on the stand and lie. It's medically impossible that you shot this guy in the front. So that's how I beat a lot of the charges because y'all shot me in the back. So when you shoot somebody in the back, they pose no harm. So the police, they can't shoot you in the fucking back. So that's what they fucked up. This stupid ass cop want to trail me from the back and shoot me five times in the back. So they could. I feel like they kind of lost their case. Are there any health ramifications to it from it to uh, today? Nah. As far as like my back stiffening up or my leg probably stiffening up, that's it. Mm -hmm. There's really no health ramifications to it. I came out clean. I still got a bullet lodged in my spine. Mm -hmm. It ain't been going nowhere. That shit act up from time to time. Um, you got lucky that you were able to walk again. I did. I got lucky with that. But right after I was able to walk a little bit, that's when they, I, I blow trial and they shipped me to prison. So, so now you're in prison as a gangbanger. Now I'm in prison as a fucking gangbanger. But I, now I'm rehabbing myself. So now I'm hitting the weights. I'm hitting the yards. I'm really learning how to walk. I got to learn how to run again because shit might go down. And it was like a long couple of years of rehabbing myself. When you go into prison as a gangbanger, are you getting, like, care packages right away? How are they treating from you? From who? From other gangbangers? Nah. 
It doesn't work that way? L- listen, I did my time in New York penitentiaries. So I did my time in the maxes. I went to I went to a couple mediums too. But once you go to jail, that's what I'm saying, it's street bloods and it's jail bloods. The street bloods got a different mentality. When you off the street, somebody else just fill your spot. Now you going to jail with the other homies. You going to jail with the big homies now. So now you you go fuck around in there. They, you're not getting no care packages unless you really cool and your man's is really going to hold you down. Really? Yeah. So it's not like in the feds where you're getting a package from your people when you show up. Not from your homies. Really? So they're not really your homies. They're not your homies. You you, you learn that. You learn that. My All my care packages came from my mother. But you still, you were forced to ride with other bloods. But see, at this time, I'm not I'm not ready to give up banging. So I went to jail with the mentality, y'all I'm about to be the biggest gangbanger in New York State. How'd that work out for you? Very good. <laughs> Worked out fucking excellent. <laughs> because so I get to jail. Now a lot I still got a limp. A lot of people, they know my story. They seen it in the uh, newspapers, they seen it on the news, and my name was ringing a little bit. So I get to jail. Like I said, now I'm starting that rehab process. So I gotta get stronger. Now I immediately get into a workout team. And then we go from there. So you're probably, are you, are you treated with a lot of respect because you had a shootout with cops? Yo, that shit was a gift and a curse because I go to jail for having a shootout with the cops. I'm good with all the inmates. It's not like, yo, you treated good. It's like, yo, you did what you had to do. Everybody wished they could do that. In my time of being locked up, I only met two other guys who really banged that police. One of them was a crip and the other one, he was a neutral. So you're going to, they're going to look at you like, all right, you did something that we all wanted to do and you good. But the police, they're going to fuck with you crazy, man. You're not eating. You're probably going to lock in. They're going to fuck with you. They're they going to they gonna get you. Then when you go upstate, in New York State, it's real racist up there. So as soon as I get to the state prison, they got your file in front of you, so they ask you, they sit you down in orientation one by one. Um, so and so, Mister So and So, uh, you in a gang? I'm like, nah, I'm not in a gang. He said, Yeah, you are. It says it right here, you a blood. I said, I don't know what to say. So he's like, You know what? You're in a gang. I'm marking you in the state as a, as a gang member. Go ahead, get out of my office. After that, they don't like bloods. Blood is the biggest gang in New York. There's no other gang that comes even close to it. Maybe the fucking Muslims or something like that. But as you being a blood, you target it all the time. And in New York, you get to wear like street clothes, which are, uh, which are state greens. So you can wear like red hats, red gloves, red shirts, red socks, red sneakers. You just got to have a pair of greens on. And I did that all the time for no fucking reason. Just to assert that you are a blood? Yeah, I'm a blood. And I said, we're going to stand out. So how did uh, inmates come at you that were beefing with the bloods? It's no, you, you're not beefing with the bloods. No one's beefing with no, the bloods. You're not, you're not beefing with the bloods. Not in New York. So you were, were, you were never in any danger? Nah. So you, you're just running the joint? I wasn't running the joint. I see a lot of people come on here and say they fucking shot callers <laughs> and all that shit. Yo, let's keep it real, bro. If you go into a pen... It's somebody there calling the shots already. So how the fuck are you a shot caller as soon as you enter the pen? Mm-hmm. Nah, you're going to start off low and you're going to work your way up. And quite frankly, I didn't want to be no fucking shot caller. I was still in rehab. So I could barely defend myself. So I need my homies to kind of protect me. When we walk in a child, when we in the yard, I need to be held down until I could get stronger. And that's exactly what happened. Do the Bloods have a shot caller in prisons? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But... See, I'm going to speak for the East Coast Bloods. You know, Bloods is different all the way, all around the world. The East Coast Bloods, it's a shot caller for every set. So you not going to be a shot caller for the whole prison. You might have a shot caller for the for the brims. You're going to have a shot caller for the UBN. You're going to have a shot caller for the Stones and for the Independents. And that's that. Nobody is outranking nobody if you got the same rank. So, nah. What about, is there extortion in, within the Bloods with other people? I know the Crips extort uh, 
uh, in prison for did the bloods do that let me tell you something about extortion that's one thing I don't like because I grew up being bullied extortion is a, is a form of being of bullying people so when I was able and ready and I got like I got my got my my skipping my hot back so I'm ready to start laying the law yo you're not extorting nobody while I'm around you're not extorting nobody when I'm around what you gonna do is you could go rob them you can go fight them but you're not going you're not going to sneak thief you're not going to go behind nobody back and steal their shit and you're not about to extort nobody cuz you you pussy you really ext- think about it how many times you see somebody being extorted by one person by one or by multiple just by one person i don't know if you necessarily see one person right you're never going to see it so the person who want to extort somebody, they want to put together a fucking extortion team. <laughs> and I'm not I'm not with that. So what would you do if you saw someone getting extorted? You're not extorting them. You're not extorting them. I'm going to come to your aid. I'm going to tell you straight up, yo, you either rob that nigga or you go fight him and take his shit. That's it. We're we not about to extort nobody, bro. But what's the difference between extorting and robbing someone? Extorting somebody is, yo, um... I see you got a package from your family, a food package, right? Yo, I want something from your package every time you got a package. Tell your peoples to send me a box of a carton of um a carton of Newports in your package. Like you 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 gotta pay for some shit. You got you gotta pay for some type of fucking protection. You gotta pay to live here or something like that. Nah, if you don't want this person here, get them out the house. So I was never with that extortion shit, bro. But you are okay if that person gets a package and someone steals that shit every week Yo, <laughs> at if the you, same time. Because <laughs> we're gonna steal it one time. So if mm-hmm. you get a package and I want your package coming up to you like, yo, Ian, drop it. Run your shit. Now, you can put up a fight, which I hope you do. And looking on the side, I really want you to put up that fight because if you put up that fight, yo, you got all the respect. You still might get your package took in, but yo, you might not get that next one took. Because now I'm going to look at a nigga like, yo, bro, yo, that white boy, he, he, he really going to fight you. He really going to put up a fight. And next thing you know, he going to get a gun. He probably going to shoot you. And now what? We got to go to war with him over you want to take his pack? Wait, a gun in prison? We call guns razors and knives. Okay. In New York. I don't know what they call it anywhere else. Why don't they just call it a knife or a shank or something? Why does it got to be a gun? (laughs) That's like some old Shawshank Redemption shit, (laughs) like a shank. Nah, we call it a gun. Okay. So, yeah, guns is knives and razors, no matter how how you see it. Um, So that's what we call it. Do the Bloods have strict policies about people that are rats? Yeah. So you not going to be, these are the main things. No homos, no rapos, no rats. So you could probably pretty much be blood as long as you ain't got those three things on your jacket. So now if you were rat, yo, you out of here immediately. If you're a homo, we can let you live, but you ain't just going to associate with us. If you're a rapo, you out of here immediately. So those, out of those three, those two things, we ain't even going. We ain't even going to talk about. It's no negotiations. Can a white guy join the Bloods? That's a that's another thing. So you can, but you probably got to be like a very tough white guy. You got to be super tough in fucking New York if you want to join the Bloods, because there's no white gangs in New York. It's no fucking. Pecker Woods, no Nazis, no nothing. White boys are just independents. You come do your time. You might be friends with some black dudes or whatever. You might be friends with some Spanish, some Puerto Ricans, whatever. There's no white gangs in New York. The only white gang in New York is the COs. <laughs> That's it. And they they fucking shit up. So you could be a white blood. I met two white bloods in my whole time being up north. So one of them is my dude, Jay Black. He from Brooklyn. He looked like a fucking skinhead. In his past life, he could have been a Nazi. So I met Jay Black. He probably like 140 pounds, soaking wet. And at the time that I met him, he got more status than me. 
he damn near about to be a big homie. So when I do start doing my research on Jay Black, it's like, yo, this dude is fucking solid. Solid as shit. And now I get into something with Jay Black. I get into some beef with the Patiaos, the Dominican gang. Jay Black come out of nowhere with two picks. He said, yo, anybody touch anybody black, I'm stabbing all y'all. And I'm like, at that, at that time, I didn't know he was really about that life. So I'm like, all right, Jay Black, I got you. I started fucking with Jay Black every day after that. Then it's another white blood from fucking Syracuse. Uh, a nigga named Guillotine. And he's probably the toughest white blood I've ever seen in my life. Like, he's beating up. If you're not moving right on a compound, if you're not moving according to blood, he's going to beat you up. He's going to stab you. He's going to put blood in your mouth. He's going to do whatever the fuck it got to take. And he's solidified. Now, what about uh, seating for food? Are you guys sitting at your own tables and no one's allowed to sit with you guys? It, it don't work like that in, in New York pens. The police control everything from going to commissary in some pens to where you sitting at. So in some maxes I've been to, the police is taking the whole block to lunch. It's controlled. So however you get in line is how you sitting when you go in that chow hall. If you deviate and try to skip somebody in line, like, yo, hold on, let me get here. Let me go sit next to one of the homies. The police is going to fuck you up. They pulling you out of line. They're going to smack your tray out your hand. And they, yo, get on the wall. They're going to put the cuffs on you behind your back, and they're going to fuck you up. And do you guys have a policy you can't touch the cops? Or are they getting nah, hit? There's no policy. Oh, you're going to get hit. So you, you guys are fighting with the, the, the Absolutely. cops, Absolutely. Wow. It's no, police is not off limits. Because they violate you so much. So why would they even risk violating you? Like, I can understand if they knew that they weren't going to be touched, but why put themselves in that position? I told you, the police is the white gang. They're the white gang. And in damn near every facility in New York, it's just strictly white police. Until you get to, like, Sing Sing, where it's a lot of black police, or maybe a couple of um, spots that's on the border of, of New York. But they don't give a fuck. They don't care. They with the shits. So if you want to jump, go ahead and jump. Mind you, they got tear gas. They got these big ass billy clubs. They got the guns in the towers. They shooting rubber bullets from the towers. So you could act up. You could get bucked, but you're going to be fucked up at the end of the day. Yeah. You so, ever been shot with a rubber bullet? Never. <laughs> never, yo. Or, or pepper sprayed or anything in prison? Never. It, it was one time uh, I kind of I ran from the police. So it was a riot of 2013. You like to run from the police, huh? Yo, <laughs> anything to to save yourself. You got to go go out with a bang. We got to go. So the riot of 2013 in uh in Elmira Correctional. That's another max. Um, Bloods got in a riot with all the Spanish gangs. So the Spanish gangs is like MS, um, Patio, Rat Hunters, um and a bunch of other fucking branch offs. So we get in a riot with them during um during indoor rec. So while we riot, it's mad knives, it's mad knives, everybody's getting stabbed up, mad knives on the floor. So one dude who tried to stab me, he ended up getting apprehended by the cops before I did. So when they got him handcuffed to the back, I see that. So I run back over to him and I just give him just one Firm kick to the head. Bow! While he's handcuffed. So now the cops, they like, yo, get on the ground. I ran across the whole field house. Across the whole field house. It's a trail of cops chasing me. And I'm just leading them on a chase, on a chase. So when they finally got me down, I told them. They circled me. I said, yo, officer, please don't hit me. I said, I'm sorry for running. Please don't hit me. Because I know if you hit me, I can't just cuff up. Now we got to fight. Now I'm be fucked up. So I told him, please don't hit me. I'll get on the ground. I'll cuff up. We good. So one cop who just saw me working out every day, he was like, yo, all right, get on the ground. We ain't going to do nothing. I never took their word for it, but I, I took it then. I got on the ground. They cuffed me up, and they just walked me to the box. And that was it, bro. That was the closest I ever came of getting fucked up by the police. You probably spent a lot of time in the box in your seven four years. Four years. You spent four out of your seven years in the box? Four years. Oh, man. Four years. New York got one supermax. It's called um, Southport. 
Southport Correctional Facility. So this this shoe is all single cell. Every time you come out your cell, you shackled, you cuff to the back or the front with a chain around you. You go like that to the shower. You go like that to wreck. You go like that to medical. You go like that everywhere. So the first time I go to the box, I'm in my program. I was taking um, horticulture. I'm like, y'all want to be a gardener while I'm in jail. So I get into it with these two white boys, regular neutral white boys. I ended up breaking a broomstick and just beating them up with the broomsticks. One of them ran, one of them stayed. So they didn't testify at the hearing. So they sent me to the box for property damage. So now while all this is happening, the windows get broke. So broomstick that's broke. They got the broomsticks. It's fucking mad potted plants on the floor. So I go there, I get six months for that. Go to another jail. While I'm in this jail, six months, this jail is gangbang heaven. It's called Bear Hill. It's gangbang central. So I get there, I'm loving it. Gangbanging. Two MS-13s pull up on the compound. Now, the blood's already there. They're not really beefing with the MS-13s, but I'm beefing with MS-13s from the neighborhood. I'm not, I don't got the, I don't got the set. People call it shot callers in other states. I don't got the set. So I go up to the homie that got the set. I say, yo, listen, there's two MSs here. I want them out of here. He was like, yo, we ain't really fucking with the MS-13s. But he was like, yo, you could do what you could do. So I set up a whip on him. Set the whip up. Setting up a whip is one person got to shoot. The other person got to fight. So that's how we get away with these stabbings. So if you win the whip, you're going to stab him. When you stab him, the, the Vic is going to turn around to try to fight you. But you already ran off. So now he got to fight me. I'm going to knock him out. You got away with the gun. I'm going down for a fight. I'll probably get 14 days lockup. That's how we set up the whip. So we walk, we go to the mess hall one day. It's hot dog and tater tot day. The most famous day on the compound. <laughs> Hot dogs and tater tots. The whole compound is out. We get the MS-13 in the mess hall. I set up the whip with the G-Shine, homie. The Herc. I say, yo, you stab him. I'm going to beat the fucking flames off him. I'm already rehabilitated at this time. I'm like at max capacity. I'm lifting the whole jail. So he like, all right. So he stabs him in the mess hall. He turned around, give me the gun. Now the MS-13 nigga turned around to me. I was just supposed to fight him, but I didn't fight him because he turned around and gave me the gun and he went to go eat his hot dogs. So I ended up stabbing the nigga again. So when I stabbed him again, I threw the gun down. That's when we end up fighting. I make it back to the house. The police come to the house. The sergeant came directly for me. He said, yo, you, come. I'm like, yo, what's up? He's like, you know what it is? Cuff up, get in the truck. So the whole time I'm asking the police, Yo, how the fuck you know it was me? Like, how'd you know? He was like, yo, you and somebody else stabbed this guy in front of 90 people. Five people came forth and they say, yo, it's the guy with the watches on his hand. So I got two watches tattooed on my hands. Mm -hmm. So the sergeant was like, yo, five people came forth and they just said it's the guy with the watches on his hand. And I was like, all right, man, fuck it. <laughs> I said, I can't beat this shit. So now they ask me the whole time, who was the other guy that you did it with? I'm like, yo, it wasn't no other guy because I'm already caught. I said, it's not no other guy. They was like, no, we know it's another guy. Everybody said it was. It's not no other guy. We got word to the MS nigga. Don't say a word. He got a big cut on his fucking face. He didn't press charges. He didn't testify in the hearing or nothing. So I just got 16 months in the box for that shit. 16 months? At least you didn't get any charges. That was a thing. Because if he were to testify, he could have pressed outside charges. That's three years, automatically an extra three. If you get caught with a gun, that's an extra three. But he didn't even show up to the fucking uh to the hearing, so he kept it solid. And I praise him for that. I never saw him again, but he's from my from my town in Long Island. Did you lose a lot of good time getting into all? Of this I only stuff? had one year of good time, and you lost that, or? But for me, as soon as I went to prison. I was counting on losing a good time. I said, I, I, it's no way on earth that I'm going to be able to get home a year earlier. 
So I moved around as if I'm doing this whole my whole bit. Which was the seven years. Yeah, and I didn't care about the good time. I said, fuck it. Good time is over. I'm just going to do the whole thing. When do you think your mindset started to change? When I was on that bus ride home. It, when you got released yeah, from prison? Yeah, I gang banged to the last day. Wow. Because it's like. Why? I'm blood. That's it. I'm blood. In and out. Blood in, blood out. So by the time I went home, I ended up being, I had the, the compound for like the, my last six months of me being in prison. So it took me fucking damn near seven years to even be a shot caller. So, so you did eventually become a shot yeah, caller. So when I say I had the jail, when I say I got the jail or I got the spot, that's what other people call like being a shot caller. So I had the jail my last six months of being in prison. They would give it to someone with just six months left? Now you got an option. You got an option within your last year or your six months to go inactive or you can stay active. If you go inactive, we'll let you go inactive. We'll keep you safe. You don't got to participate in no shootings, no riots, no fights. We'll keep you safe. It's our obligation as Damu to keep you safe in your last six months so you don't catch a charge so you could go home. So they brought that to me. I said, you off your fucking rockers if I'm going inactive because I can't sit here and watch my homie fight right next to me or get in a gunfight right next to me and I justify it like, yo, I'm inactive. I feel like you pussy. You, I, and nah, I wasn't doing that. So what was the day-to-day life at holding the keys to the to the car, I guess they'd call it, right? Becoming stressful. a shot caller. Stressful as fuck, man. And I see guys glorifying that shit. It's like, it's just the dumbest shit in the world. I got it on a default because prior to getting in my last six months, it was offered to me when I got to that jail, Auburn. And I kept saying like, yo, no, I don't want it. I'm good. I kept telling my big homie, because my big homie was in the spot. He's like, yo, handle this shit how you handle it. I don't want to hear nothing about this. I want you to run. I'm like, nah, bro, you the big homie. I don't want nothing to do with it because it's stressful as fuck controlling a bunch of niggas in your set. Not to mention, once the police get wind that you calling shots, what you think is going to happen to you? They're going to shoo you up. They're going to set you up. They're going to flip your cell every fucking day. And now you're a target. If you make the wrong call, you might get fucked up by your own kind. So if I make a wrong call, like, yo, son got to get got to get shot. Son got to get out of here. And the homies actually do it. And he wasn't supposed to get shot. Now it, it fall back on me. What do you think are some misconceptions that the the public, normal, average people have about shot callers? Because it's glorified in movies. It's it's put out there. You know, it's every time you title something prison gig shot caller, you know, people are interested. It's it, it, it it's not interested at all, yo. Like I said, that shit is stressful and it's stupid as fuck. And like the biggest misconception is that a shot caller is safe. You're not safe. You're the biggest victim on the compound if you a fucking shot caller. Because if everything got to go through you, imagine how much hate you creating from other people. Imagine how much like animosity is being built up towards you from other people, not even in your set, not even in your gang, just other people. So now you being a shot caller, now we do got ops. We do got other ops in the prison. Who you think they coming after? They're not coming after the little blood. They they going you gotta cut the head off the snake. They're coming after the biggest blood on the compound. So the biggest misconception is that you fucking safe. And I hear guys talking about, yo, I, I was the such and such ranking at a jail. I'm good. I'm safe. I'm controlling all the drugs. Yo, you sound stupid as fuck, bro. You sound dumb as shit. You the biggest victim in the jail as being a fucking shot caller. I couldn't wait to go home. <laughs> But you, you did sign up for it, though. I did. And I feel like, yo, once you sign up to be in a, uh, a gang, you got to you gotta be the biggest fucking gang member in your gang. You got to go all forward. You got to push the agenda. You got to push whatever's going on, yo. So far too often you hear guys that go to jail and they fucking turn Muslim. They, they don't want to beef no more. They like, yo, man, I want to concentrate on my bid and my family. 
Nah, man, I said, fuck my family. I didn't get no visits my whole time in prison. I barely got packages. Every bitch that I was fucking with left me. They left me in county jail. My baby mother left me. She said, yo, I can't do all this time with you. So I didn't have nothing. All I had was the gang. That was it. Do you feel like you chose the gang life over being a father during Absolutely. that time period? How does that make you feel now? Uh, I'm still, I'm still putting all that, all that together. When you sit back and think about it, it make you feel fucked up. Like, yo, I dead ass chose the gang over raising my kids. But the kids that I had when I first started gang banging, they fucking 20 years old right now. So they, they understand, they understand. Did you ever end up renouncing gang life? Never did. So you still, you're still technically tied to them? Technically. Technically, you could say I'm active. But my whole thing is... You were, you're not out carrying guns and getting into shit. My whole thing is, yo, it's a gang member and gang banger. So, you're a gang member. You can be a lot of things to that gang. So, you could be the monetary aspect to that gang. You could be a political aspect to that gang. You can teach the youth. You can do a lot for that gang as still being an active gang member because when you out in the streets, who do you think the kids is going to listen to? To the people with the lived experience. Lived experience and 99% who's still active. Now, when you're a gang banger, oh, that's when you're going back to jail. <laughs> you're going to die, you're going back to jail. you gang banging, you out there, you shooting at the ops, you clapping shit up, you robbing shit. You're extorting shit. That's what that's everything you're doing. So what do you think your role is now then? Are you the teacher? Are you the 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 people kids can look up to? I tried that. When I first got out of jail, I tried, um, they wanted to recruit me for like some nonprofit shit. Some dude was starting a nonprofit down in Queens. And he like, yo, you exactly who I need on my team because you're still in it. You've been through it. So I think the kids want to hear. And I told him straight up, bro. I said, listen. The kids these days, they don't want to hear shit from me. So the only thing I got to offer the young up-and-coming gangbangers is how to survive in jail. <laughs> That's it. I'm not going to tell you to stop banging. I'll probably tell you how to bang, but I'm going to tell you how to survive once you get to the maxes. Once you get behind them walls, I'm going to tell you how to move. I'm going to tell you how to survive. I'm going to tell you how to handle the police. I'm going to tell you how to handle the other gangbangers. I'm going to tell you how to handle your ops in jail. I can't tell you to stop gangbanging because they tried to tell me that when I was younger. And I was telling all the old heads, like, yo, eat a dick. Like, get the fuck out of my face. Like, we going to paint stain you on these streets if you don't get the fuck up out of here. So I, I didn't end up going through with that shit. I left that alone. Like, nah, I can't. I can't talk to these kids. Because mm -hmm. soon as one of these stupid fucking kids disrespect me, I'm going to revert back to like, yo, you disrespecting me on the yard. Now I'm gonna have to shoot you. So I left that alone. I, I play my I play my position. What do you do for work now? I drive trucks. You drive trucks? Yeah. Okay. So upon me coming home, it was like my cousin wanted to join blood. And he like, yo, listen, the Brims wanna recruit me, but I told him you out of jail, so I want to join your set. I said, the fuck you ain't? I said, yo, get out of here, man. I said, yo, the Brims ain't doing nothing. They're not recruiting you. You're not joining my set. You're not nothing. you staying neutral. And my whole thing was, I would never turn nobody blood. I would never turn no family member blood. I would never turn nobody on the street blood. I would never turn nobody blood. Because you don't, you don't know what you're signing up for. So turn blood somewhere else and go put in work for your set in that way. Now, if they asked you to put in work now, what would your response be? A, a negative. <laughs> You're retired. Yeah, like, who the fuck you talking to? Yo, so I turned blind when I was fucking seven, 17. I'm 37 now. So 20 years, I'm, I ain't going to say 20 years of full gangbanging. <sighs> Let's say 15, 14 of full gangbanging. Like, constant, like. We in it. I don't even give a fuck. We here. And you're not telling me to put in no work. But I was never that dude where somebody would tell me to put in work. If I knew it was work to be putting in, I would handle it. Because I, I was that type of homie. 
So, like, you can't come up to me. If we in a spot, me and Ian, and you come up to me like, yo, 40, dude over there snitching. I might shoot you for telling me he's snitching. Why, you ask? Because you let that snitch get away from you to come and inform me. So now I feel like you're looking for help. Now I feel like you ain't the right type of blood to be around me. So if you know somebody snitching, yo, clap them right there. If you know somebody a homo, we can't fight homos. We got a rule. You cannot fight a gay person in prison. If you know somebody gay, you know somebody a homo, get away from them immediately. If you have to talk to a homo, bring another homie with you. I got to verify what's going on around here. I don't want no back and forths because a homo is like to cause a lot of confusion in gangs. Like, oh, I did this, I did that, and if you ain't got nobody to back it up, then you fucked up. If you know somebody's a chomo, a rapo, don't come back and tell me you better shoot them right there. So, and that's how I did it. If I knew it was work to be putting in, it's immediate. You know, the prison gang life is fascinating. <laughs> like, because there's just so many rules and intricacies and this and that. And you could get your head blown off if you don't know specific rules. So, like, who to talk to? <laughs> well, they talk to you. They refer to you now. Yeah. You read a whole book on it. Man, how listen. To, how to survive in prison. How to, I could do that. And that's what I told dude. I said, man, I could only tell you how to survive. So I did that seven years. Then I ended up catching a parole violation when I had to do a, another year. So that's when my eighth year came in. So when I caught the parole violation, they sent me to Sing Sing. And then I ended up getting to jail in Sing Sing again. So now I'm telling all the close homies, listen, I'm going home. I do not want the spot. But now I'm fronting to all the other homies that's out my set and the, the rest of the population because you still go with your same DIN number on a violation. You don't change your number. So I'm telling them like, yo, yeah, I never went home. I was in a box. <laughs> so they like, yo, 40, where you been? I'm like I was in a box because by the time I caught the violation, I was, I was in the street for like two and a half years. So I told them, I, I just two and a half years in a box, lying my ass off just so they don't know that I'm going home. Because when you get shorter and shorter, people want to fuck your bid up. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. Yep. So I was a habitual bid fucker upper. For people? For people. How would you fuck up someone's bid? Because I'll tell you straight up, bro. I'm already content with my good time being gone. I don't got no visits. I don't have a fucking girlfriend. I don't got a wife. I can't make phone calls. So essentially, jail is my house and jail is how I'm moving. So if you don't move according to banging standards or jailhouse rules, I'm fucking your bid up. <laughs> so how I will fuck your bid up, if I know you getting visits, I'll probably punch you in your face right before a visit because there's no self-defense in jail. So now you're losing your visit the next day. We're both being locked up for 15 days. Another way I'm going to fuck your bit up, New York got trailers. So every 45 days, you could go fuck your wife. Don't argue with me if you got a trailer. Don't come on the yard starting no bullshit if you want to fuck your wife next month. Because now I'm going to set a car up on you and I'm going to get you stabbed. Or I'm going to fuck your bit up. I'm going to fight you in the yard. Another way, people in the maxes in New York, you could get a visit every day. Every day you could get a visit. So if I know you somebody who getting a visit every day, I'm fucking your visits up for about the next two weeks because we're, now we're both going to be locked up. So I was a habitual bid fucker up. And I didn't want nobody to do that to me when I caught the violation. So I told the homies, yo, listen, my, my close homies, y'all just came from off the street, bro. I didn't come from the box. I'm lying to them niggas over there. So uh, I've only got a year. And then they was like, yo, you got the spot. I'm like, yo, I don't want the spot. They're like, yo, but you got to have, I don't want it. And I stayed away from being a shot caller for about like six to eight months into the 12 months until I got it on a fucking default when the nigga that had the spot, he didn't want to be blood no more. 
So he's been blunt for like the last 20 years. He's like, yo, I'm tired of it. I want to bow out gracefully. Boom, boom, boom. We want your blessings. Da, 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 da. So I give him my blessings. And now by default, I got the shit all over again. With like four months to go home. And it's like, yo, man, this is the weirdest shit ever, yo. You're back in charge. I'm back in charge. <laughs> and it goes from, yo, you got to take count on the yard. Now I'm I'm walking around the yard. I'm watching every fucking blood on the yard. I'm making sure they good. I'm watching for the police. And it's like, yo, it's, it's stressful as shit, man. It's not a good thing being a shot caller, having a spot. How do you make sure your kids don't go down the same path that you did? I threaten every gang member they around. Are they putting themselves around gang bangers? So my kids, they actually was putting themselves around the opposite gang. So they grew up in a town that was Crip. So by the time I came home, they already knew, like, yo, yo, your dad is fucking crazy. So their big brothers or their parents know about me. So now I'm home. So... Mind you, I said in the beginning, I don't really feel like Bloods and Crips beef on the East Coast. That's really some West Coast shit. So I was always able to be around Crips. So now I'm starting to be around the young Crips that's chilling around my daughter and going to school with my daughter and my son. So one time, one of the young, one of the young little lokes came up to me. He was like, yo, listen, big homie, I really like your daughter. I want to ask her out. I don't know if she's feeling me. I say, yo, listen, bro, I don't know if she's feeling you, but you could go ask her. But my daughter already told me straight up, like, yo, he a bum-ass nigga. He out here gang-banging. All he do is smoke. He out to go to jail, whatever, whatever. So I let him shoot his shot, and she just curved that nigga anyway. But it was another crip nigga. He was going up north to go do three years. So before he went up north, I don't smoke, but I ended up smoking a blunt with him. And I'm telling him, I say, yo, listen, you about to go up and have the worst three years of your fucking life because bloods run every jail. And if you're a crip, crips are not in population in New York. All crips are either PC'd up or they in the box. They go hide in the box. As soon as you go to population, you get stabbed or you get beat the fuck up. That's for every fucking crip. Unless you tough. So I told him, I say, yo, I seen a couple of tough crips. This is what I think you should do. Soon as you go on the yard, let it be known, yo, you cripping. And if any blood got a problem with you, we could go fight on this corner. Go catch a couple fades because at the end of the day, they're going to respect you. And I only seen one crip nigga do that my whole bed. This crip nigga, I ain't even going to drop his name, but he'll come out the box and he'll come up to the, to the homie's table. Be like, yo, my name is such and such. Y'all know who I am. Any blood want to fight me? Come over here. And he just be beating niggas up. Beating beating the homies up. Left and right, yo. How's your relationship with your kids now? Perfect. It's That's excellent. Good. Yeah. So I got a good relationship, you know. We argue here and there, especially the older ones. But What's your, like, outlook on life now? What are, what are your goals as now that you've put that kind of behind you and, and you're looking forward? Yo, I tell I tell my girl all the time. Because she asked me the same shit. And I'd be like, I don't got no goals. I live my life day to day because I know it could be snatched just like that. So one day I'm walking down the street. The next day I'm waking up two months later. So I respect I respect death way more than I respect life. Because everybody want to live, don't nobody want to fucking die. I'm really accepting death. So everything I do from day to day, I'm doing it to the fullest. Whatever I want to do, I'm gonna get it done. It's I don't I don't put no hold on nothing. I get everything that I want to do done. So my outlook is on, on life. Yo, live your life to the fullest, man. Don't put that shit on hold. Don't be like, yo, I'm gonna do this shit tomorrow. I'm gonna get this shit done the next day. Get everything done, cause yo, tomorrow's not promised to you. I love that. Franz, thank you for coming on the show today, man. It's been great conversation. No problem. Um, really interesting to hear about, uh, like, the inner workings of uh, prison gang life in, in New York like this. Yeah. <laughs> it gives it a different spin, you know? Uh, Every state is different, man. Yeah. Every state is different. I ain't never been locked up nowhere but New York, but every state is different. And a lot of shit that go down in other states ain't going to go down in New York. 
A lot of shit that go down in New York, I know it's not going to fly in other states. <laughs>